So good morning. Uh, we are switching now to a slightly different topic, and this concerns uh, hereditary gastric cancer syndromes. We do not have much time, so what I'm going to do is just uh, to present to you an update of what has been done recently in this issue regarding this issue. So the, the first good news is that uh, we'll have published next month uh, the new version of WHO book on the classification of tumors and the first of the volumes in this fifth edition concerns digestive system tumors. So this was a big group of people working on the, this new version of WHO book. And the good news regarding what we are discussing here today is that uh, in that uh, in that system in this book can we go ahead can we move in this uh, the good news in this only this one okay the good news here even so is a bit blocked <laughs> and help from there from the back no They, they seem not to get interested in it. Okay, it's moving now. So the good news regarding this issue is that in this new book, we have a, a long list of syndromes, genetic tumor syndromes of digestive system that we are discussed. This appears in these books for the first time, and these syndromes cover the whole lengths of the GI tract. And specifically, what is of our interest here is that it's also covered separately GAP syndrome that I will address in a minute, as well as hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. So these are the best news I can present to you. These will be available. I think that every oncologist will be most interested in this new data. In this presentation, I will take also some information from uh, papers from our group that you can see in the literature. But let's come what is now known about familiar hereditary gastric cancer. Everybody knows that the large majority of gastric cancers are sporadic, and uh, this constitutes 90% or more, and only 10% of gastric cancers occur in a familial setting. And when we talk about hereditary, it concerns only those familial cases for which a germline mutation has been identified, and this is something like 3%. And uh, these the three syndromes are the syndromes of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, the GAPS, and familial intestinal. So the hereditary diffuse gastric cancer was described the, for the first time in New Zealand by a surgeon and it was 1964. But it was only 1998 that Perry Guilford had the opportunity to study large kindreds from these individuals in New Zealand that are fantastic because there are many generations, the opportunity of the expression of the phenotype, all those that are highlighted here, many patients have died. So what they've done was to elucidate which type of gastric cancer these individuals were carriers, and they uh, discovered this was diffuse type of gastric cancer. So they decide not to swim in the dark, but to go directly to the search in blood of the affected patients for the alterations in e cadherin gene, which is CDH1. And they managed to demonstrate a linkage between the phenotype and these germline mutations. So they come up to identification of this syndrome that is hereditary diffuse gastric cancer that is today very well known. You know that this gene is localized in chromosome 16. It's a long gene. It's not so easy to study. This was, as I was showing here, 1998. It means last year it was the 20th anniversary. So in celebration of this anniversary, there was a meeting of the consortium that since then has been studying this type of hereditary gastric cancer. This was in New Zealand, South Island, in Wanak. I can tell you it was one of the most fantastic meetings I have attended. And the people from all over the world were there. But interesting, who was there also were the representatives of the families. And you can see several family members. This is the mother of all these patients. And I'm carrying one baby who is the child of one carrier of CDH1 mutations who was submitted to prophylactic astrectomy. So this was the participation of all types of professionals, including family members. 
And, uh, but uh, anyway, it is already known the basics of uh, hereditary diffuse cancer cancer. This is already in WHO. So we know that hereditary diffuse cancer cancer in what concerns pathology. It is characterized by the occurrence of many small foci dispersed in the stomach, as you can see in this drawing there, that represents the stomach. And also what happens in hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, this pointer is far from being good, but you can see that there are not only many lesions dispersed in the stomach, but also these lesions are well known and are now described as in situ carcinoma, parstoid spread, and early invasive. It is already known, it was uh, since quite long, where the mutations are localized, and it's important to know that the large majority of mutations in hereditary diffuse gastric cancer and CDH1 gene, they are truncating mutations localized in this graphic above the bar that represents the gene, and much less are mutations of the missense type. You can see the distribution of different types of mutations, and these different mutations, as I said, the large majority of them, they are truncating, and only about 20% are missense. What is relevant today is not only to be aware of this, but to be aware of something else. It's not only the detection of the mutation. It has to be certified if this mutation is pathogenic or not. And what I'm showing here is the representation of 50 pilot variants of CDH1 mutations that are curated by a panel of experts. What does it mean? It means that some of the mutations, they are clearly pathogenic, so they are actionable. But many mutations are not clearly pathogenic because they can be benign, those represented below the bar. They can be benign or they can be variants of uncertain significance. It means that every board in the world, some of you, for instance, having individual carriers of these CDH1 mutations, they should check if they are pathogenic or not, and they should provide information to this panel of experts to identify if some of uncertain significance can change to clear benign or clear malignant or pathogenic, because actions will depend on that. If I show you a brief summary of what has been done since the SIND was identified in 1998 until these days, uh, at the beginning when it was discovered, it was identified that about 55% of the individuals would be carriers of the mutation. Later, with the criteria that were developed by the International Gas Cancer Linked Consortium, this number of individuals that are positive for CDH1 mutations increased, and this increase was for something like 36%. And it was also possible to identify that there are more than point mutations. They are deletions that should be searched for. So unless your patient is tested for not only mutations, but also for deletions, you should not be happy with the result. So coming with this type of approach, and also taking in consideration target DNA sequencing and exome sequencing, a lot of information accumulated in the meantime. So the number of negative families is decreasing, and what is relevant is besides CDH1, there are other genes people should be aware of, and one of these genes is the gene encoding for alpha-catenin that should be considered also in the genetic screening. There are other genes such as PALP, B2, TP33, BRCA2, which meaning is still waiting for confirmation, but the gene encoding for alpha-catenin, there, there are no doubts. And if you compare hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, and if you compare hereditary diffuse gastric cancer related CDH1 mutation with hereditary diffuse gastric cancer related to the mutation in the gene encoding for alpha catenin, you see that both are dominant. The risk of gastric cancer in alpha catenin carriers is not known. In both cases, diffuse type. In hereditary diffuse gastric cancer related CDH1, you should expect that breast is also affected, which is not known yet in hereditary gastric cancer related with alpha-catenin gene defect. 
So in the stomachs, as I mentioned, what we see is can be in carriers asymptomatic with normal endoscopies, a high number of lesions that encompass not only early gastric cancer of the diffuse type, but also the precursor lesions that we have identified and published, and these are parasitoid spread or in seed carcinoma. What is relevant regarding the understanding of the significance is the molecular mechanisms leading to the inactivation of the second allele of ecadrine in hereditary diffuse gastric cancer is different in a primary tumor from what is observed in the node metastasis. In the primary tumor, the, pro the first mechanism is promoter hypermethylation, while in the metastasis is loss of heterozygosity. We are far from knowing the exact reasons why the mechanisms are different, but this is a demonstration. It would mean maybe that for the node metastasis, is those with loss of heterozygosity are in a way um, selected for this dissemination. So this is what we know about the pathology of hereditary gastric cancer, and now this is not moving again, something against, no. <laughs> Can I have this moving? Hmm. Can you help to move the slide forward? request a technique. Okay, Thank you. so they, they are taking part of my time with this, but uh, the important thing is that now is clearly established that for identification of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, you should take in consideration not only full criteria, but also supporting criteria. So for an individual to be considered for testing, genetic testing, they are very well known criteria. And let me remind you that a single patient with diffuse gastric cancer younger than 40 is a candidate for genetic testing. Do not forget there are other side signs such as lesions in lip and cleft palate, and these are important also for highlighting that we can have. So what will they be the clinical management strategies in this setting? The first is the identification of patients in family of developing the disease and in consult, in, including, as I said, cleft lip and palate and globular breast cancer. These individuals should be identified for genetic testing. These days is mandatory to search not only for CDH1 mutations and lesions, as I said, and if negative, to search for mutations in the gene encoding for alpha-catenin. And these patients should be integrated in a program for risk assessment and risk reduction measures. In this program, in the setting of hereditary diffuse cancer cancer, it is clearly determined that the patient should be offered the possibility of being submitted to gastric uh, reduction, uh, risk reduction, uh, reduction gastrectomy, also designated prophylactic gastrectomy, and the surveillance procedures are controversial. Anyway, the patient can opt for this, and this should be offered in a reference center with high quality protocols. Regarding globular breast cancer in this setting, it's on the contrary, the patient should be submitted to bilateral surveillance at the age by magnetic resonance image and prophylactic mastectomy is not recommended these days. If you now move quickly to the other the syndrome of hereditary gastric cancer, which is gastric adenocarcinoma and proximal polyposis of the stomach, I don't know how many among you are aware of this syndrome. This is completely different. This is a polyposis syndrome in which the patients present with proximal polyposis, carpeting polyposis, hundreds of polyps restricted to the proximal stomach, corpus and fundum, and sparing the antrum. These polyps are mainly of the fundi clan type, though other phenotypes can exist. But the most important is that these fundi clan polyps, they can display dysplasia. This was in a patient nine years, and dysplasia can be high grade, and in a proportion of individuals, there is invasive gastric adenocarcinoma of the intestinal type. This was described by the first time by um, a group from now from Australia. This was 2012. Soon afterwards, the same year, there was also a publication in GUT from a Japanese group. By that time, all these genes were screened for mutations 
impulse groups, they were completely negative. So it took four years, and it was in 2016, that it was possible to identify the genetic basis of this syndrome. And this is a mutation in APC gene, in a specific portion of the gene, which is in the promoter region. And I highlight this because it's crucial to have the mutation dislocalization in the exon 1B. And this is absolutely crucial. So what we know, you know that APC mutation is also responsible for familial adenomatous polyposis. So we think there is one gene, several diseases. One is the typical familial adenomatous polyposis in which the mutations occur in exon 15. The other is the attenuated forms as the extremities of the gene. And here, with the specific agnostic phenotype, we have the mutations localized in the promoter region, which is absolutely specific. So what it means in practice for you clinicians is that when you have a polyposis proximal fundicland type, you should be faced between the decision between gaps and attenuated FAP. And the major clinical difference is that in FAP, you have colonic polyps. In gaps, you have gastric polyps. Although in FAP, you can also have polyps in the stomach. So if you have polyps in the colon, you should not consider gaps because the phenotype is gastric restricted and you should be aware that there is a special presentation of this type of polyps which are fundicland pipe and as I said, there is the possibility of occurring displays and invasive cancer. This was the first case described in Europe in Czech Republic in the Congress very recently organized by Florian Lordic here in Czech Republic, there are only in Czech Republic eight additional families with this syndrome, so I'm afraid there is in Europe many more families. You should be aware and search for them. This is from Austria, and this is from the Czech Republic, as I mentioned before, eight new families, and again in Japan it goes on being described. So is this relevant? Yes, it is, because there are consequences, as you could imagine, for the identification of the patients, their treatment, and the identification of carriers. So the criteria for the identification of gaps is now clearly stated. We'll see this in WHO book, and you have here the proximal polyps, very high number, fundicline polyps with dysplasia, should appear this phenotype in one proband of family member, but what is absolutely fundamental is that the mutation is identified because you can have fundicline polyposis restricted to the stomach that can be sporadic and it is absolutely crucial to make this differentiation. With this differentiation. We had recent one of those cases and we still do not know what the genetic cause is because it's not localized, but it's a phenocopy of what is characteristic. So when we come to hereditary gastric cancer syndromes, one major message here is that the phenotype is crucial. It's in your hands, but the confirmation of the syndrome requires genetics. So what, is, what matters the most for the identification of the syndromes, you can say both. And uh, with this, I end my presentation. And thank you very much for your attention.